Welcome to the Utah State Historical Society's 69th Annual Conference to our keynote address with Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Um, before we get started, I want to thank our conference sponsors, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, the Utah Department of Cultural and Community Engagement, Utah Humanities, and Utah Westerners. Let me take a minute to introduce our speaker, Dr. Cooper Owens. Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens is the Linda and Charles Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She is an Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecturer, a past American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Research Fellow, and she has won a number of prestigious honors and awards for her scholarly and advocacy work. A popular public speaker, Dr. Cooper Owens has spoken widely across the United States and Europe. She has published articles, essays, book chapters, and think pieces on a number of issues that concern the African American experiences and reproductive justice. Her first book, Medical Bondage, won a Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Historians as the best book written in African-American women's and gender history. And it has just been translated into Korean, which is awesome. Um, we are so, so privileged to have Dr. Cooper Owens here today. It is, uh, it's a thrill actually to have her. Um, so today, um, Dr. Cooper Owens will talk for about 45 minutes and then we are pleased to be able to open up the chat and the question and answer period after that. Um, so please y'all submit your questions via the Q&A box. We're also live on Facebook and we'll be monitoring there. With that, I am going to invite Dr. Cooper Owens to take it away. All right, thank you so very, very much for having me. Um, and it, you know, I have to give my formal thanks to the Utah Division of State History, uh, to Holly George, Jedediah Rogers, who have been absolutely wonderful in uh, helping me to be a part of the Utah State Historical Society's 69th Annual History Conference. I also thank Alicia Rowley for her work behind the scenes regarding uh, tech. So I am going to share my screen with you. All right, before I begin, let's see here, perfect. So I think it's really important to understand as many of the missing gaps in the history of medicine, um, because it really is a large part of American history. And so when I first began this project, I remember you know, when I was a grad student, people were like, slavery? gynecological surgery, what do they have to do with each other? I hope to, to reveal um, the, the linkage uh, between these two seemingly disparate fields, but also put the past in conversation with the present. Why does history matter in medical education? Okay. So first I'll start with a brief discussion of medical racism. And I like to start in the 19th century, in the antebellum era, with a guy that some of you may have heard of. His name was Dr. Samuel Cartwright, and I'm gonna kind of point to, to his location on my screen, which is to my left. So the image of Dr. Cartwright um, is one that most people wouldn't recognize, right? but if you're into the history of medicine during this period, he's a really infamous figure. Uh, he wrote during the 1830s an article about the differences in the Negro and, uh, and white people. But he specifically honed in the kind of distinctive uh, illnesses or diseases of the Negro. And he, he didn't just do it because he didn't have anything to do. In fact, the state of Louisiana's medical association respected his research so much. He had such, uh, was, was held in such high esteem that they asked Dr. Cartwright to conduct this research. And so he does, and he publishes an article and it makes a huge splash. And he had some really interesting findings. And so Dr. Sam Cartwright found that in fact, the Negro had thicker skin than white people, that if a Negro slave 
uh, was harboring the thought of running away or ran away, that Negro slave suffered a form of mental illness called drapetomania. He had another condition that he came up with called rascality. I mean, there were a number of, of distinctive Negro. Um, I'm so sorry. I think the noise might be on my end. So I'm going to go back to share my screen. I apologize for that. Um, and so he had a number of these distinctive uh, diseases. One of them was also Negroes are prone to clay eating or dirt eating. And so, you know, so on it went. This is the thing, though. Sam Cartwright might have, might have been seen historically as a flash in a pan. That wasn't so. A couple of decades later, Sam Cartwright begins experimenting lung capacity between Black and white people. So he's already setting the stage in the antebellum era for this kind of medical and scientific research between two disparate groups of human beings. And so if you look to my right, you'll see that he is, uh, you'll see an image of a, of a spirometer, and this is from the antebellum era. Well, the spirometer is used to assess lung capacity. In fact, it's an instrument that's still used today by, by physicians and clinicians. And so Sam Cartwright once again does this comparative um, research between the Negro and the white man. And what he finds is the Negro capacity for taking in air in the same amount or capacity as a white person's is diminished. Right. And this research becomes so important that it influences scientists and medical doctors during the Civil War. And so the Union Army, through the U.S. Sanitary Commission, uses data and also conducts experimentation on the, the difference between the Negro and the white uh, and a white person's lung capacity. Right. And so this has repercussions not simply because people are interested in the, the, the seemingly biological differences between Black people and white people, but also at the heart of it is, are Black people fit for freedom, right? Now, in the 20th, uh, 21st century, we might say, well, of course, uh, you know, Black people might have a diminished lung capacity because they're living in slave cab cabins that are not insulated. They're living in the direct, um, Direct, uh, in, uh, directly in front of chimneys and fireplaces that affects their breathing, all of those kinds of things that we consider social determinants of health, right? Cartwright might have known that, but it wasn't included in the research. And literally, that kind of legacy of, of medical racism lingers to the 21st century. So typically, when I give these talks, I'm often asked, okay, you wrote a book about the 19th century, but what about now? Surely people don't believe this. And unfortunately, there are a number of studies. Um, one of the more well-known comes from uh, Dr. Kelly Hoffman uh, out of UVA when she was a grad student there. And in 2014, she and her research team conducted, uh, they conducted an experiment, a research study. This was a smaller sample, so almost 300 people. I'll actually list a larger sample that comes up with some of the same uh, findings that Dr. Kaufman, uh, Hoffman had um, at the end of my talk. But Hoffman and her team went to UVA's School of Medicine, and they surveyed medical residents and doctors. And what they found was actually not that surprising. The effect of medical racism was still present. And I often have to remind people, these are students and faculty members in one of the country's most esteemed and high ranking medical schools, the University of Virginia, right? Founded by Thomas Jefferson, right? So it's a, a public ivy. And so these students who have already graduated from college, they already have bachelor's of science degrees, right? When they're asked about um, pain perception between white and black people or biological differences between black and white people, most of them believed that there were biological differences between black and white people. They believed that black people did not experience pain. And if they did experience pain, even for really painful conditions like kidney stones or for black women in particular, black birthing people, childbirth, 
they tended to believe that the management of pain was easier. They believed that Black people aged quicker than white people. And two of them amazingly believed that Black people were born with tails, right? This is from the 21st century. So where does that leave us in terms of people who are graduating from schools, from undergraduate institutions, where they've been taught, right, that race is a, is a social construct, um, that there are more similarities between human beings who look different than differences. And yet they're going to these high-ranking medical schools with a belief rooted in 18th and 19th century racial science. So what my book aimed to do was really give a, a, a kind of intellectual genealogy of the development of this branch of medicine in the United States, but to also think about the ways through my public speaking about how we can help to dismantle right, the tentacles of medical racism. So how was I brought into this? I'm a historian of slavery, a historian of medicine, and like any other, but at that time, uh, assistant professor of history, I wanted to write a book. You know, I thought maybe my friends and family and 10 other folk who were really into uh, the history of medicine would buy it. But little did I, did I know in 2017, when I was still living in New York and teaching at Queens College, that I would come face to face with confronting uh, the contested legacy of James Marion Sims, who is known as the father of American gynecology. And in fact, you're looking at an image of Sims, uh, of his statue in New York, in Central Park. And for about a decade before, there had been a East Harlem group, and this is where uh, his statue was located in New York, at the easternmost uh, corner. In, in Harlem. So this East Harlem Preservation Group had been you know, really trying to get the statue removed since 2008. But it wasn't until 2017 that the New York's Parks Commission and Mayor de Blasio started to pay attention. And why did that happen? Many of you will remember, 2017 was this tumultuous political moment when a lot of young students from across the nation, but especially in the South, started to protest the placement of statues honoring Confederate uh, military officers. A lot of Northerners thought, eh, this doesn't have anything to do with me, right? And yet in New York, here was the statue that was done to recognize James Marion Sims and his contributions. And so a number of young people from a group called the uh, Black Youth Project 100 staged a political protest in August 2017. And I often, I offer this uh, often as uh, an aside. I remember that morning I started to get all of these text messages and DMs and I'm at the age of my life where I don't get DMs on social media. So I'm getting all of these messages. Hey, why didn't you tell me that you organized a protest? And I'm like, what protest? And this picture went viral. The woman in the head wrap, Jewel Cadet, was the vice president of the Black Youth Project 100, and she was the person who organized this. When the picture went viral, all of a sudden, all eyes were on uh, James Marion Sims' statue and this grassroots organization by community activists to remove it. And I literally was transformed from Deirdre Cooper Owens, assistant professor of history at Queens College to the country's foremost historian on James Marion Sims. And so I was inundated with media requests and they weren't interested in the history of gynecology. They were much more interested in whether I believe the statues should stay or remain. But as someone who A, has a undergraduate degree in broadcast journalism and mass comm, I knew I didn't want to contribute to the kind of sensationalist nature of this framing. And as a historian who was deeply invested in having people understand the landscape of the antebellum South, slavery, and also the history of medicine, I didn't play nicely. I, I didn't answer their questions. I really started to talk about the legacy of Sims, but much more about the way that uh, different medical branches, you know, I obviously specialize in uh, obstetrics and gynecology, but how these different medical branches were really tied to the country's uh, most successful up until that time economic labor system, which was slavery. 
And after this happens, right, the statue was eventually removed a little less than a year later, and a number of birth workers in the New York area in particular started to, to ask me, hey, okay, you've written this book, thanks, we now know the information, what are we going to do with this? Because the country right now and then was facing a Black maternal health crisis that placed the United States as the most dangerous place for a Black woman or birthing per a person to become pregnant and to give birth. Right. And so I had to figure out how in the world do I present information so that students in medical schools and colleges are not believing these these fictions about biological difference, but also these fictions about the black body that's harmful. Right. And so that begins really with helping people to understand the history of um, of, of American medicine, but also doing away with these very simplistic binary framings of, you know, of whether we should think of Sims as a savior or a monster, because that doesn't help us, right? Things are always more complicated. And so I really wanted us to do away with these kinds of framings, right? Savior of medicine, a savior of women or medical monster, the front legacy of South Carolina's most infamous physician. This was from uh, the South Carolina Post and Courier's uh, investigative article in 2017 done by Lauren Sauce, a great article, but the framing of it is either or. And as we know, right, you all are all practitioners of history. We know that things are a bit more complicated. And so what I first wanted to do was answer this question that was floating about that people had been saying on both sides, right? So the defenders of Sims's legacy were saying, well, Sims was exceptional because here was this man who cared so deeply for these enslaved patients that he worked on, that he brought them into his home. He, he incurred all of the medical costs and financial costs, uh, well, financial costs associated with this medical experimentation. And he worked on them until he was able to cure them of this dreaded condition. And then the critics came, I mean, they were literally saying that Sims was, you know, this brute who was determined to destroy the reproductive organs of enslaved women, that he intentionally uh, got them addicted to opiates, and that he was the person who created the belief that Black women didn't experience pain in childbirth. And so here I am as a historian, and if you haven't noticed, as a Black woman historian, right, having to say, wait, all of this information is actually not accurate. And so, you know, there were people who became angry, and I'm saying as a historian, what, I'm, what I have to offer is the most accurate information I can find based on the records. And so if we take this question of whether Sims was exceptional, I kind of say he wasn't. But I have reasons why, right? First, I have to kind of clear away all of the fictions and mythologies around Sims. And so what I do is I start in the 18th century, right? The late 18th century. And I talk about this idea that had already been developed about Black people having different responses to pain, right? Ideas that Black people were somehow, um, somehow, uh, less prone to experiencing um, sensations than white people. I then give you literally in the first chapter a kind of intellectual genealogy. We can consider it kind of like Alex Haley's roots, the roots version, right, of American history. And we start to see that the things that Sims did and wrote were based on histories, scholarship, practices that had already existed, in fact, before he was born. And then some of the, the critics, right, who frame him as a kind of historical boogeyman, I have to tell them, actually, if you understand the 19th century and you understand the history of medicine during that time, or medical practice, excuse me, during that time, you'll find that opiates were used because if you are cutting someone, right, you're, and then suturing them up, especially in the genital area, you don't want them to break their stitches. And guess what? Opiates cause constipation. Well, why in the world didn't Sims ask these women for consent? They were enslaved. Enslaved people were considered chattel or movable property. And so whether he asked them or not, 
it doesn't matter. They don't have a legal right to, to, you know, to have their answers merit um, acceptance, right? So there are a number of things I needed to correct. And so I do this with, you know, kind of outlining the professional work of men like Georges Cuvier, a French-born natural historian and scientist. I'm really interested in his work um, where he dissects Sartre Bartman's cadaver. I'll talk about her in a bit, but she was uh, derisively known as the hot and tot Venus in the late 18th century and early 19th century. And then I move across the pond to the American West at that time, Ephraim McDowell, who was Virginia born, settles in Kentucky, and he becomes known as the father of the ovariotomy, right? Where he performs a number of experimental surgeries on enslaved women. John Peter Matower, another uh, slave owning physician, early pioneer of the very surgery that Sims perfects, and also known as the father of American plastic surgery, but also Francoise Marie Provoche, the father of the cesarean section, another French born physician. He uh, leaves France in the late 18th century, in fact, in 1799, so right at the turn of the century. And he settles in France's most economically viable and richest colony, Haiti. But there are rumblings of a, of a revolution that's about to start. So one year later, he leaves. But during that time, Provoche was able to experiment on a number of Haitian women to perfect the C-section. When he lands in the United States, in Louisiana, another former French colony, he continues his experimental work on enslaved women trying to perfect the C-section and is in fact considered the second American to perform successful uh, C-sections. And the interesting connection between that, where I'm saying we're so busy concentrating on Sims as this historical boogeyman, and we're forgetting about the, the structural or systemic nature of medical racism, that Provost's work is actually, I think, you know, I'm not going to say much more important, but it's something that we should pay attention to. Louisiana from slavery to freedom, and I mean up until the 21st century, was the number one state where physicians relied so heavily on African American women and birthing people to perform C sections that up until the past 10 years, they were either number one or somewhere in the top three, right? It's literally a line that had been unbroken from the 1830s to the 21st century. And so for me, taking away this exceptionality narrative becomes very important in understanding Sims uh, and the, it, it Sims' his place in the 19th century, but also the legacy of his work. So Ephraim McDowell, is uh, actually let me go back to um, uh, Georges Cuvier briefly because I think it is important um, to understand why I included him. His work on the hot and tot Venus. She was a South African-born woman who was enslaved. Uh, she was sold by her owner to his brother and an English uh, partner. They were fascinated with Bartman because she had a big butt. That's essentially it. And they thought, my goodness, we could make money. And so they transport her from South Africa, right? The Indian Ocean, all the way to, to London, to Piccadilly uh, Square, where she's made to perform these tricks, almost like a circus animal. She's either partially nude or dressed in flesh colored clothing. Uh, about two to three years later, she sold to a French zookeeper. And this is how Cuvier enters the picture. Cuvier is, uh, running the menagerie at the National Museum of Paris. And he's extremely interested in, in understanding the Hottentot. And so he is, is trying to perform these experiments on Bartman. She really resists. But shortly thereafter, um, you know, when she becomes a part of uh, Cuvier's um, experimental kind of collection, she dies at the age of 25. So she she doesn't live long uh, when she's transported to uh, Europe from, from South Africa. She was uh, sold at 17, dies at the age of 25. And, and Cuvier wants to understand why she is so different, right? Why does she look so different? Why is her body different? And so he performs an autopsy on her cadaver. And guess what he finds? Nothing of note. In fact, she's like any other woman, any other human being. But 
here is what I'm interested in. He doesn't just perform an autopsy and then you know they bury her or get rid of her remains. What he does is he removes her bones, cleans them up, they're put on display at the museum. Right? She dies in the very early 19th century. Then he removes her brain, preserves it, puts it in a bell jar. He cuts out her genitalia, preserves it, puts it in a bell jar. Because even in the afterlife of slavery, Bartman's organs have an educative or pedagogical um, uh, you know, reason for uh, a kind of pedagogical reason for existing, right, in that preserved state for those who are interested in the supposed differences of Black people versus white people. And in fact, her remains are displayed until 1970, uh, 1974, right, when they're lost. And so unlike others who've written about Bartman um, as this kind of phenom in popular culture, I'm really interested in the ways that Cuvier uses her as an exemplar, right, for how we write about, think about, examine, and treat Black women's bodies. So when we move to the United States uh, in 1808, Ephraim McDowell begins his experimentation on uh, enslaved women. But he enters into this field by happenstance. A white woman, Mary Todd Crawford, comes to him with a distended belly. She's in intense pain. And she's wondering, how in the world can I, I rid myself of this pain? And so McDowell does a number of you know, kind of examinations and probes. And he guesses that she might have ovarian tumors. He and her husband begin to you know, talk about the ways that they can, you know, pay, you know, the townspeople are going to be against this. Surgeries are quite rare in the early 19th century. Also, he's not that well respected because of a grave robbing incident that happened when he was younger. But the husband says, okay, you know what, my wife is in so much pain. Yes, we both agree to the surgery. On Christmas morning, right, 1808, I'm sorry, 1809, McDowell performs surgery. He removes an ovarian tumor that's over 21 pounds. Amazingly, Mary Todd Crawford lives for a number of decades, right? She comes in in her 30s, lives to her 70s. Between 1809 and 1817, when his article is published, McDowell experiments on five negresses, as they were called, four of whom were enslaved, one was a free woman of color. Why is the time period really important here? The Constitution banned the Atlantic slave trade in 1807. So 1808 becomes the first year that the United States has a real interest in preserving the reproductive health of enslaved women because enslaved women are the ones who pass on the hereditary condition of slavery to their children. So it doesn't matter if the, if the fathers are Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, actual fathers of enslaved children, right? Slave owners, overseers, or just some random guy who has access to an enslaved woman's body. The father could be Black, Indigenous, right? Doesn't matter. As long as an enslaved woman is pregnant, her child is, is enslaved. The child inherits her condition. It goes against everything in a patriarchal society. But by the late 1600s, right, colonial governments and slave owners know right, that the wealth is contained in women's, in, in, in Black women or enslaved women's healthy wombs. So McDowell is operating on these women during a time where you know, the, the country, right, people in power are invested in maintaining enslaved women's reproductive health. Unfortunately, one of those women dies. But by the end of this nearly 10-year uh, experiment, he publishes his findings, and he thinks he's going to make a huge splash. The article goes thud, right? And in fact, a British doctor in The Lancet, right, Britain's leading medical journal, says, well, of course, the patient survived, right? Of course, he could perform these kinds of of surgeries. They were negresses and they bear cutting with the impunity of dogs and rabbits, animals that are known, right, for their fecundity. And so here you have, once again, this idea 
that surgical, um, you know, surgical pain doesn't exist for Black people. This was done between 1809 and 1817, well before Sims even has a medical career. John Peter Mattel, pioneer in, in obstetrical fistula surgery. It was considered um, in the uh, considered in the antebellum era. You know what? I am so sorry. I'm wondering if you all were able to see my screen. Let's see here. I think you might not have been able to see my screen. I just recognize that because I didn't see you. Can Holly, I'm going to ask for you to just speak. Could you see my screen before? We couldn't, but it's okay. You were so wonderful to watch this matter. Yeah, we, we, it, now we can see your screen. It's wonderful. We've got John Peter Matower now. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, I'm just not sure if you were able to see my screen. Uh, Deirdre, Deirdre. Ah, Dr. okay. Cooper, so I'm going to go it. back to just to show you the pictures. I apologize for this. It's a technical glitch on my end. So here's Samuel Cartwright, the, the book of the spirometer. I am so sorry for this. Uh, Kelly Hoffman, who conducted the UVA study. Here is the image of James Marion Sims. The protest, uh, the picture that went viral that I spoke about. The front page, the title of the front page article from South Carolina's Post and Courier newspaper. The exceptionality question, the names of uh, Sims' uh, colleagues and uh, the folk that he kind of, he symbolically uh, descended from. A picture of Ephraim McDowell, the father of the Ovariotomy, who I just spoke about, and John Peter Matower. So I am really sorry um, for uh, that technical glitch. I will send the PowerPoint to uh, the Utah State Historical Society so that you have access to it. All right, so I'll begin again with uh, John Peter Matower. Like uh, Ephraim McDowell before him, he was a slave-owned physician born in Virginia, uh, and Matar is an institution builder. You know, in his career, he founds the Randolph-Macon College of Medicine. It's no longer in existence, but it was one of the few colleges of medicine in the South. And he was a pioneer in the obstetrical fistula surgery, as it's called today, that Sims perfects in the 1840s and 50s. And uh, it was called vesicle vaginal fistula. And so essentially what that means is a woman who has a very prolonged uh, delivery, and I'm talking about days, two to three days, a, a doctor is called in because this is an emergency, obviously. And what happens is either, and this is pretty rare, the woman gives birth um, or the doctor has to remove the fetus. But what happens is a tear, right, in the vaginal area or in the, the anus. And the doctor um, is left with a patient who suffers from incontinence. And as you can imagine, lots of infections, there's a stench, all of these kinds of things that are going on. Remember, we're talking about a time where slavery, the engine of slavery, is, not, is no longer dependent on an international slave trade, but a domestic slave trade and healthy births. So James Peter Matar is trying to correct this, right? Because he has to increase the value of enslaved folk, especially women, and also fix them of this, of this condition. So he does comparative experimental work, one on a white woman, one on a, uh, an enslaved woman in Virginia. And they're both suffering incontinence and the infections and all of those kinds of things. They're about the same age, so late teens, early 20s. And Matawar sutures using what he calls a silk suture method. So he stitches up the white woman patient, right? And tells her to rest. She cannot engage in sexual intercourse. And within a number of weeks, she's cured or fixed to use the language of the time. The enslaved woman, he does the same surgery, right? Surgical repair, silk sutures, fails. For eight clinical trials over a number of years, 
Matar tries this. Once again, this is a, almost a full decade before Sims attempts this surgical repair. He's trying, he's trying. The enslaved woman cannot become fixed. She's not cured. So Matower, you know, he, he accepts defeat and he publishes an article. What's telling in this article, at least from my perspective, you can sense his frustration. And he writes, if the patient had stopped participating, well, he says engaging in sexual intercourse, she could have been healed. This is a full stop moment for me because I'm like, sir, you're a slave owner in the antebellum era in Virginia. You obviously know that enslaved people don't own themselves. Legally, they're not even considered human beings. They're considered movable property like ducks or tables, right? Like, like oxen. How in the world could an enslaved woman stop engaging in sexual intercourse, especially if it was forced? What if she was married to an enslaved man? I mean, there are so many ways that we can interpret that. But what it does show is that, A, there's no real biological difference between black and white women because he's performing the same surgical repair, reparative method, the silk suture, right? But number two, if we think about the negative effects of slavery as a social determinant, a negative social determinant on this patient, it has a long lasting effect, right? The, the existence of slavery and what it does to the body, especially reproductive labor, right? On enslaved women shows that their bodies are unable to heal because of this kind of engagement. So we then move to James Mary Sims. He's the person that everybody, you know, kind of talks about and wants to know about and they pin everything on him. And I remember giving a talk once to uh, members of the James Mary and Sims Society in Charleston, South Carolina. And, you know, initially they were kind of like this in the audience because I guess they thought I was, I was gonna kind of drag Sims. And by the end of it, they said, oh, well, you know, they, they, were, they were shocked, you know, I didn't know about this. And so James Mary and Sims has become a kind of pariah, right? I'm not here to defend Sims, Sims is dead. He doesn't need my defense. He lived a a pretty good life, right, during the 19th century. But what I am here to say is, let's get rid of this narrative where somehow he was more brutal than anybody else. And I'm saying, no, 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 he was a descendant of those men like Cuvier and McDowell and Matar and so many others before him, right? That he literally inherited a set of beliefs, right, ideologies about um, gender and race and status that had already swirled and existed in, in the atmosphere, so to speak. And so Sims comes into gyne uh, gynecology, much like McDowell. A white woman comes into his medical practice. She had fallen off a horse. He writes in his memoir that she had a retroverted uterus. And so once he asks her permission to perform a vaginal examination, those were very rare in the 19th century. He remembers something he had been taught in his medical school, Jefferson Medical College in, in Philadelphia. He says he remembers if you could open up the vaginal cavity so that the rush of air comes in, it could literally turn the uterus right side up. That's what happens. Every time I say this to doctors and nurses, they laugh. But that's what he wrote, right? So, he, so this is how kind of serendipity would have it. In his slave hospital, I mean, in his hospital, excuse me, it wasn't a slave hospital yet. In his hospital, there was an enslaved woman. And she comes in suffering from vesicle vaginal fistula, right? And so Sam says, I can't fix this. But when he examines the white patient, he has this idea, oh my goodness, what if I can open up the enslaved woman's vaginal cavity and observe where the whole, right, is. What if I could do that? And so he uses two pewter spoons. He opens up, performing, you know, a, a kind of visual examination. And he writes in his memoir, I had seen as no man had seen before. Things were as close as the nose on my face. 
And so he collects, a, he, he canvasses the county. This is in Montgomery, uh, uh, Mount Meigs, a little town right outside of Montgomery, Alabama. He canvasses the county, goes to a number of slave owners and says, hey, if you lease me your slaves, I will fix them, I'll incur costs. Now here are the ones who defend Sims. Wait a minute, Sims took his own money. Well, guess what? That's what people who lease slaves did. Sims was also a slave owner. He understood the business practices of that labor institution, right? Medical colleges did it. Um, so, you know, physicians too, slave owners did it. This was common practice and leasing was a common practice. I often point people to Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, they had been leased as children, right? So once again, this was a very common practice. This had no bearing on one's compassion, right? Or magna magnanimity. It was simply the practice of the day. So he, as he writes, he leases about a little over half a dozen enslaved women from throughout the, the surrounding area. We know the name of three of them, Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy. And over a nearly five year period, Sims performs in Mount Meigs, and then he later moves to Montgomery, Alabama. He performs experimental surgery on these women. And he tries every method you could think of, right? He's, he uses Matara silver, sutra, um, excuse me, silk sutra method doesn't work. He uses pewter and iron. Those really don't work. And then settles on sil the silver sutra method. And in fact, that's still used today, right? Um, and so remember those pewter spoons. He then later perfects, he doesn't invent, but he perfects the speculum. So he further develops it so that it becomes a two-billed speculum, much like the, the ductile duck speculum that we see today uh, during pap smears. He develops this so you have greater um, access to a visual examination of the cervix area and the upper vaginal cavity. So if there is something that Sims is really exceptional, it's about branding because it becomes uh, the surgical position becomes known as the Sims position. The uh, speculum becomes known as the Sims speculum. And he was already a prolific medical writer, right? So after nearly five years, Sims after, gosh, 30 surgeries on Anarka, a number of surgeries on the other, he, he claims that he has now found a cure for this dreadful condition, right? He sends the enslaved women back. So that's the, the, the normal history of, you know, Sims and the history of medicine. Well, let me tell you what you do when that history doesn't really tell you anything about the enslaved women. We don't even have the names of them all. And so people have often been like, oh my goodness, you're brilliant. And I'm like, thank you very much. But I actually didn't do anything in terms of my methodological approach. The only thing I did was, what if we told the history of American gynecology's development, not from the physician only, but we include the patients who were enslaved. What if we pivot our lens to focus on the enslaved women? What can we learn? So here's a little walkthrough, right? What historians do. Everybody focused on a census from 1850. And typically those who have written about Sims wrote about his wealth in looking at the census. Okay, this man owned at least 17 enslaved people. I, however, wanted to know what can I learn about these enslaved women? So out of the 17, I found five were considered male on the census. We don't know their names. All of the males were children. So I said, okay, that takes away, um, you know, any idea that this, they could have been married to these women. These were probably the women's sons. All right, got it. Now, what can I learn about the 12 other females as listed on the census? Some of them were infants, others were elderly. So what that meant was I had to then cut away the children and the elderly folk. All right, Sims was right when he wrote that there were a little over half a dozen cases. I, I said, okay, yeah, eight or nine folk. There was something else though. Even though we don't know their names, we don't know anything about these women except their ages. I saw that there was one enslaved person listed as a mulatto. And that one person listed as a mulatto was also the youngest person on the slave farm. And I thought, oh my gosh, this child was born during the experimental phase, right? My father used to work at the, the National Archives. 
So I know a little something about census collection and data gathering. People don't collect the data the same year the census is published. They collect it before. We all, you know, we all know this, right? So this means from 1844 to 1849, right? That that nearly five year period, a child is born and is two years old. And by 1849 or 1850. So that means the child was born in either 1847 or 1848 when the experiment is going on. I'm totally blown away right by this because the one thing you don't want to do is get someone pregnant if you're trying to suture them up. I mean, if we think that, you know, giving them opiates, uh, you know, an opiate so that they don't break the sutures via a bowel movement, my gosh, what is a pregnancy and, and birthing session going to do? But what that means is someone had access, either Sims or you know, some other white man had access so that that child is marked as different racially from the other enslaved people. And what does this tell us about medical ethics in the 19th century? We know that A, miscegenation is considered a crime, but also ethically, even in the 19th century, the, there are some, some deeply troubling, right, biomedical uh, ethical issues that are going on. This is also around the time that Sims writes, the community withdrew support. His two white male medical uh, uh, apprentices quit. This was around that time. So although I don't have answers, right, I can raise questions around that. So when people were much more interested in me discussing informed consent, I'm like, informed consent doesn't, it doesn't extend to enslaved people. But what I can have questions about in terms of biomedical ethics is the birth of this mulatto child. So for me, it was how do you tell a history of, of American gynecology that is much fuller and accurate, right? And so you read the sources, the same sources differently by putting your attention on different historical actors. The other historical inaccuracy I wanted to, to uh, address, everything that I read, wiki entries, encyclopedias, other people's articles, listed uh, Sims' hospital in New York, the New York State Hospital for Women, as the first hospital created uh, in the United States for women. And I'm saying, wait, Sims wrote about the hospital that he had built for himself in the antebellum era. He wrote about this in his articles, but also in his, in his um, autobiography, The Story of My Life. How is it that we totally ignore what Sims wrote, right? That he had a hospital built for himself. How is it that that hospital doesn't exist where he actually perfects the surgical repair for vesicle vaginal fistula? That just escapes, right, the historical record but the hospital he finds essentially for white patients in the 1850s is the one that, that is seen as the first hospital. And so the first sentence of my book in the first chapter essentially says the first hospital for women founded in the United States is in a slaving community, right? And so that's how I'm connecting this institution to the development of this medical branch. Um, this is another way, right, when we think about the kind of erasure of uh, enslaved people, the institution from uh, this medical history. In many of the articles that came after Sims's, uh, you know, surgical, uh, innovative surgical repair, you'll start to see that the nurses and the patients are rendered white. So it's either his work in his hospital in New York, but even if the text is talking about the enslaved women, and Sims was not you know, like most 19th century physicians, he wasn't, you know, reticent to, to mention that these were, these were Negroes, but the illustrations, right, were of white patients, which is very different, right? We know that when the enslaved women were, exper uh, excuse me, operated on, it was done publicly, they were naked. You can see in this picture that Sims is literally, his hand is on the patient's knee, and on the thigh, right up underneath the buttocks, and the white nurse is the one guiding the instrument inside of the patient, right? So very different rendering from what Sims writes about uh, that happens. And so where does that leave us today, right? 
what's the legacy of these kinds of medical developments, but also medical racism, right? Um, that these developments came about because of slavery's um, access for, you know, the access that doctors had to enslaved people. What that leaves us with is Black women and birthing people three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. Right? I've said this before. I think it bears repeating. The U.S. is the most dangerous place for Black women and birthing people to not just be pregnant, but to give birth. Um, and many medical organizations uh, are finally, and hospitals and doctors, um, nurses, the doulas and the midwives have already been you know, kind of on it uh, in the best way. But many of the other practitioners, thankfully, are now realizing there are no biological differences. It's not race that's the factor in the Black maternal uh, crisis, right, regarding morbidity and mortality. It really is anti-Blackness. And so remember, I started with that um, study by Dr. Hoffman at UVA that took about 300 folk that they surveyed. Well, Rachel Hardiman, an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, um, she and her team, right, they combed through nearly 2 million records in Florida between 1992 and 2015. And they found that in these births, when the practitioners were Black, that maternal mortality and morbidity rate was cut by over 50%. So you now have in, you know, that, that happened in the spring of this year in April 2021, the CDC finally saying, you know what, medical racism is a public health crisis. You finally have doctors and organizations like the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists saying, hey, we're going to have to confront this, right, because the lives hang in the balance. And the more we know about the history of this and the things not to repeat, Right, the patient blaming and believing in these kind of biological differences and, and giving space to racial cognitive dissonance, we can move from having Black women historically and in the present, we can move them from object to compassionate subjects whose lives deserve the care and attention um, that we need to get them to live. So I thank you. I apologize for the technical glitch, and I look forward to your questions and your comments. Dr. Cooper Owens, thank you. That was um, <laughs> was really good. Cool. Oh, Holly, I can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, first, can can anyone can I be heard? I can hear you, Holly. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we are going to open it to questions now, and I still can't hear you. Deirdre, you can't hear me. Okay. All right. Let's figure out how to fix this. Okay. I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Okay. Great. Great. All right. Well, for the question and answer period, we've invited Brooke Lefevre, who is a PhD student at Baylor in history, to join us because Brooke's work, uh, Brooke spoke yesterday and she has written about infertility um, with a, a Mormon polygamous wife. So it's in, in kind of, you know, the 19th century. <laughs> so kind of the same era. So Brooke is going to ask a couple of questions and I've got a couple and then we're going to open it to the audience. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Cooper Owens, thank you so much for um, talking about your research in your book. I wonder if maybe you could talk for just a couple minutes about um, the relationship between history and activism. You talked about this statue of J. Marion Sims. You talked about the presence of medical racism today. Um, how, do you, how do you think about what should be that relationship between history and activism? And yeah. Thank you, that's a, a great question. It was, um, I have to say, as, as the historian, we're trained not to insert ourselves in the story. And so with the writing of this book, I actually inserted myself, but largely it was because, and, I, and this is in the afterward, uh, afterward of, of medical bondage, I was undergoing in vitro fertilization. And um, it, it was not successful, but, <laughs> but during the diagnostic process, I underwent some really painful procedures without anesthesia. And one of the nurses who was a, a black woman, as we started to talk about my work, she said, oh, wow. So are you gonna include this in the book? you know, you are a, a PhD student in history. And I said, no, I write about dead people. I can't include myself. And she was like, girl, you better include yourself. And it was literally this moment of having birth workers and medical practitioners say, thanks for, for providing the history, 
but what do we do with it? How do we make sense of some of the things that people were going through in the 19th century that are still persistent in the 21st century? And so what, what I think is important is to um, do a lot of uh, synergistic work with these, with these workers, letting them guide the way in terms of activism. So I consider myself an advocate, not necessarily an activist, um, but a part of that work has been working with hospitals, medical organizations in particular, with um, this creating learning modules around respective care, patient-centered care. Um, so I've done some work with ACOG, California State Department of Health, um, a number of other entities. I do a lot of public uh, talks with medical organizations, birth workers, activists, artists who are interested in reproductive and birthing justice. And I write um, a lot of op-eds or commentaries in, in newspapers um, for, for lay audience. So I think that there are ways that we can kind of stay in our lane as scholars, right? I don't proselytize in my classroom because I teach the history of the Western medical tradition uh, that doesn't necessarily deal with race. Um, I teach the history of American medicine and it's much more than just um, women's medicine. But I do think that there are ways that we can help shape the curriculum, um, that we can work in partnership with organizations and provide them with the critical analysis that we've learned as historians. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, kind of building off of that, another question that I have um, is we know, right, that race has structured so thoroughly, not only the society that we live in today, but also the society that we study historically. Um, and as this is a, a Utah, you know, historical society, um, a lot of historians of Utah focus primarily on white middle to upper class historical figures. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, you know, what do historians who do focus on white middle upper class figures, how do they make sure that they're really understanding the function of race in their in their the stories that they're telling i think you can focus on i mean one of my chapters is on poor irish immigrant women right um but I, what i do is i present a racialized experience of these women um so it's not just about their ethnicity but also the the ways that whiteness is is being transformed in the antebellum era and so i think you know in spaces i live in nebraska which is a majority white state uh as well um, I think that there are ways that we can apply the um, lens of race to white people, right? That it's not just an experience of people who are not white, but in this society, right? We are thinking about what a raced and racialized experience is for all people. And so you can, you can still do that with a, an elite um, white population. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to pose some of the audience questions. And um, again, for our attendees, please send, send your questions via the Q&A box. Um, we're monitoring those and want to be able to ask them for you. Okay, so an anonymous attendee writes, regarding the study done at the U of V or University of Virginia Medical School, what were the demographics racial of the respondents? Was there a difference in answers among different groups of people? I realize this was a really small study. It would be interesting to do the same study in different medical schools. Yeah, that's a great question. So like I said, it was under 300 um, and uh, over 60, I think it was 67%, almost 70% of the white respondents, you know, gave the, the answers that I provided earlier. Um, UVA doesn't have a necessarily diverse student population. I mean, like lots of, of medical schools. Um, and so the demographics tend to be kind of, quote unquote, students of color equaling um, less than, than 40%. Um, but some studies have been done um, that's similar to the UVA study, Harvard, University of Chicago um, over the years. So there are a couple of studies that have been done, um, you know, highlighting the ways that people think, especially about pain um, and racial difference. But yeah, I think if, if we could do what Rachel Carterman and her team did, you know, with millions of records, um, that would be that would be great. That would be great. Thank you. Um, Scott Poppin asks, um, he says, okay, so he's a physician who trained in New Orleans and he benefited greatly from the experience gained in public hospitals. 
which were largely segregated even in the 1980s. The tradition of teaching hospitals largely caring for people of colors continues today. Now that we're finally getting much more serious about tackling institutional racism in medicine, what should be done about these public teaching hospitals? Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I was shocked. I have a god sister who, who I'm, I'm not going to say the name of the hospital, but I suspect I know that hospital in New Orleans that has um, a kind of, I call it the, the, the point of origin story for its creation in the antebellum era. And it was certainly a hospital um, that was dependent upon uh, enslaved patients. So if we're talking about the same hospital um, that still treats um, patients who are disproportionately poor and people of color, I think that there has to be something punitive put in place. And I say that as a historian, <laughs> typically what happens um, within our country historically, things don't change unless there is something punitive. And so if this is a hospital where the rates of infant mortality, morbidity, maternal mortality, mor morbidity are higher than the national average, um, we need to know those doctors, those, those nurses, um, you know, what is the uh, accreditation um, agencies doing? right, to hold these people accountable because you can't keep replicating the same damning statistics um, and doing the same thing. And so learning modules are great. I help hospitals with them, but they aren't the end all be all, right? And so how do you, you know, I remember having this conversation just a, a couple of days ago, how do you disabuse people who are already formally educated? And so they know the facts. How do you disabuse them from believing in in ideas that are ultimately harmful, right? And that's the kind of cultural fix um, that I think, A, having something punitive, because now people are gonna be motivated to not um, you know, be fined or removed from, from the practice, but having something that's gonna hold people's feet to the fire. But thank you so much for that. Yeah, we have a, a question from my colleague, Wendy Rex Atzet. And Wendy asks, I imagine that in your advocacy work, you may play a diplomatic role between medical practitioners and scholarship on race. How are medical practitioners responding to this new thinking on how institutional racism infuses medical science and practice today, not only in the past? You know, it's interesting. So I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir. So the, the, the institutions that reach out, they, they are aware. Um, many of these are, you know, kind of institutional um, leaders and pioneers in the scholarship of race and medicine. So they're already on board. Um, what, I, what I tend to emphasize to uh, many of these folk, and almost all of them are urban health systems or, or, uh, or organizations, is to also think about um, access as it relates to rural spaces and doing research on other populations because as much as I'm invested in you know, not having the US be such a, a dismal place for, for black women and broken people to, to be pregnant or give birth, we need to know more about native communities. We need more information about Latinx communities. We need more information about poor rural communities, white rural communities. Um, I often you know, tell them about where I grew up. So I grew up in Washington DC, but also in South Carolina. And I'm from the low country, so that Gullah Geechee region, and it's, also considered one of the poorest regions in the state. Um, lots of black counties. I come from the county that has the highest um, percentage of African Americans living in it, so almost 80%. It's the poorest county in the state. I graduated high school in 1990. There's not been an OBGYN ward in our hospital since 1990. I'll be 50 in a few months. So, you know what I mean? So it, it's, this is incredible to me. And so what do you do if there are no doulas, there are no midwives, there's only one OBGYN, and technically you can't give birth in Williamsburg County. So that means you better have transportation and take you to Florence County or Georgetown County, you know, or Buford, one of those, those other counties because our hospital isn't equipped for that. So that's also a reproductive justice issue centered around access and rurality and class that I also think is important. And those organizations have not given the kind of attention that they need to to that. Everybody kind of wants to do black and white issues. And I'm like, that's great. 
But we also need to think about those poor people in rural spaces who are impacted by reproductive injustice as well. Yeah, and you know, that's something that really affects us here, also in the Intermountain West. I'm from Burley, Idaho, and yeah. <laughs> um, Jedediah Rogers, I asked him to, to jump on and ask Molly. us. Yeah, uh, Dr. Owens, thank you for your comments, for your presentation. Um, I, one, of the, one of the aspects of your work that I find really interesting is that you amplify the voices of enslaved women, um, I understand from your book, Irish immigrant women, yeah. through sources that are written primarily by men, by white males. And maybe this is building somewhat on the second question that Brooke had asked. Mm -hmm. It's also building on some of your comments about teasing out information about individuals through the census uh, materials. But I'm wondering, and I can imagine how challenging that work is to find these voices of underrepresented individuals. Yeah. Can you speak to that challenge that you faced as well as any recommendations to this group? Many of us are historians. How yeah. do we, how can we do more of this by giving voice to individuals who may not be very visible in the, in the documentary record? Yeah, you know what, it's, um, thank you for that so much. I, I don't, so, so let me first say, I don't know if I'm giving them voice. I don't know that, right? Um, and I don't, I don't know if I will ever know that. Um, but what I try to do is read between the lines. So in that sense, I'm really inspired by the work of um, scholars who did um, women's history in the colonial period, in the antebellum era, a lot of feminist scholarship, uh, a lot of womanist scholarship. Um, and what that means is how do you write a history of a group of people who were forced to be illiterate? So they don't leave written records. Um, I often joke, that's why historians of slavery <laughs> it takes us so long right, to publish books <laughs> because you're literally trying to parse out these, these lives uh, which are fragmentary already. And then you're also aware that when you're dealing with enslaved people, they don't want their private lives exposed. So there's also the kind of ethical balance for me. These are people who would have wanted to be hidden, right? And here I am revealing their innermost lives in, in, in their kind of most fragile positions as people who are sick as well. So I'm always thoughtful about that. Um, but what I do is, I, I am reading as much between the lines that these, um, that these male physicians and slave owners are, are providing for us. And in some ways, the, his, the historical record is really um, rich and giving, right? That doesn't mean I don't have critiques about the archives, but in this way it's rich and giving because slave bodies are economically valuable. And so these folk are writing down everything they can when it comes to ailments and, and, and these women's experiences. Now they might discount them, but they're still writing them down. So the, the documentation is voluminous in terms of the records, but there are also ways that I can also say, wait a minute, there's some racial cognitive dissonance going on because the Sims writes or any of his colleagues, you know, they're writing in an era where they don't believe that say black people experience pain or black people are more lascivious or, or whatever it might be. And yet in their notes, they'll say, Betsy lost sense of herself and struggled violently. I had to get someone else to, to restrain her. Well, number one, why would you restrain someone who doesn't experience pain? Why are you treating her like you would treat any other patient? So I'm already saying, wait, the archives always has to be grappled with and interrogated with and seen suspiciously, viewed suspiciously, right? Because if you actually believe this, your practice wouldn't be identical to the same practice as white patients. Number two, why are you experimenting on people who are biologically different to cure white people? And they know this, right? They, they get these women impregnant, uh, I mean, you know, uh, impregnated. They live with enslaved people. So they understand enslaved people intimately I mean, ways that even I think in our racially segregated societies of the 21st century, black and white people don't necessarily understand each other in the same ways um, because we don't often share the same physical space. So I'm looking at all of those things and I'm reading it from the perspective of the folk who can't leave the records. But at least I can say when they say, oh, and these, these slaves came and interrupted my work to tell me that Nanny 
was fragile because she birthed all those babies. Well, this is also a way for me to say, wait, they interrupted his work? So how important was it for the community members of this slave farm or plantation to let the doctor know she's suffering, not because of what you think, but because she had all these babies. So it's a way of highlighting the gaps, right? And at least putting what was written about them on the page in a way where I am literally piecing the fragments together so that if it's never whole and complete, that's okay. But at least we get some composite of how enslaved people are moving and thinking and behaving and reacting to what's going on around them, that they're thinking subjects, right? Not simply objects. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions. And, and before I do, I just want to preface saying that a lot of what you've talked about today, um, I think are good practitioner kind of principles, and I mean historian practitioners, um, you know, the, uh, the, the um, things are always more complicated. <laughs> That's like the story of our lives, right? Things are always more complicated. And, um, and, I, and I also love the, you know, as a grad student, you're like, no, I'm going to study this. Yeah. No, no, I, I think I'm going to do this. But what I, what I wanted to ask you about is, and, and really Brooke's talk yesterday is mm -hmm. what got this going in my mind. Um, and Brooke, you can jump in to correct me. She wrote about a, a polygamous woman who was infertile and had horrible procedures, <laughs> horrible cervical procedures. Um, and, and that they were inspired, right, Brooke, by Sims's work. And, and so it just really, you know, is another bit of evidence, a good, good piece of evidence that uh, Sims was not exceptional. And so, uh, which is, is heartbreaking. Um, mm -hmm. I want to know what, what in our current system is not exceptional? that we should be paying attention to? What should we be paying attention to that we might not even see because of our blinders, yeah. of what we swim in? Yeah, what I'm finding um, when we talk about patient-centered care, I mean, these are things where I'm like, oh my gosh, is this the 18th century, the 19th century, the early 20th century, when we don't listen to patients or believe them, right? That, I mean, and, and I say this as someone who, I mean, I am totally, working for a system and invested in a system that is as hierarchical as medicine, right? So I step into a classroom, I'm Professor or Dr. Cooper Owens and my students are called by their first name. So I understand hierarchical systems and the imbalance of power and all of that stuff. Um, but even in education, I think that there are more, there are greater ways for students to have a voice in ways that patients do not. Um, and so folk are aware of that. But how do you change something that's so intrinsic to, to this hierarchical field? Um, that's number one. So, so not listening to patients or believing them. Um, this is, my goodness, an age old question in the United States. You know, when I was teaching US history surveys and we're talking about democracy, I would often say, what institution is older than, you, you know, American democracy? They don't know, slavery anti-blackness. I was like, if we think about the colonial period, slavery existed far, you know, before the concept of democracy existed. So when it's woven into the fabric of our nation in a colonial and post-colonial moment, how do you, once again, disabuse people of ideas around racial difference or anti-blackness, you know, um, that they might not be aware of? Um, I'll give a, a perfect example for that. I often talk about people needing to be critical around lines of inquiry. So I gave a talk to a department of pediatrics um, not too long ago. And there's a syndrome known as wimpy white boy syndrome. So Dr. I'm looking at Dr. Potvin, who studied in New Orleans, you might have heard of that, right? And it's this syn syndrome, white be, uh, wimpy white boy syndrome, that supposedly means that when a white male newborn infant is born, um, and, and underweight and play, you know, prematurely underweight placed in NICU, the belief is this uh, white male newborn infant has less, a lesser chance of survival than a white female newborn, black male or black female newborn infant. So there are more medical or critical interventions that are made. And statistically, it seems as if 
white male uh, newborn infants, you know, are having a harder time when they're first born. The response though is different. A, you know, the, the ongoing research has been pretty inconclusive that this is something that's race-based, even though race is in the very name of the syndrome. And number two, I said, okay, let me put a pin in that and let's go to something that happened in the 1980s. Remember crack babies. I said, if you actually read the four page medical journal article, you'll see that the doctors and his research team originally looked at a multiracial group of patients. It's multiracial, not just black women. Latinx, white, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in indigenous, right? And it was only 23, only 23 members of this sample study. The doctor, in fact, and his team wrote in the article several times, more research needs to be done. But they described the symptoms of these women who were, you know, they were crack users. The media hears about it and all of a sudden they forget about the other folk and they only focus on the black women. And all of a sudden black women who are pathological are giving birth to crack babies. We now know, you know, 20 something plus years later, that they're, you know, all of the things they thought would happen to society and these babies were all false, right? And so when we then go back to revisit the wimpy white boy syndrome, I said, guess what didn't happen? in this instance, the mothers weren't blamed. The mothers weren't seen as pathological or criminal. What happened was doctors and nurses created a space for medical interventions to happen so that they could save these babies' lives. The line of inquiry was not equal. So when we had crack babies, instead of the medical interventions needing to happen, how do we save these babies who were born to mothers who were using drugs? It all of a sudden became black women produce babies through their criminality and pathology. And so once again, you have to be aware. And I remember the group of pediatricians, nurses, blah, blah, admins, you know, they were just kind of like, oh. and I was like, y'all, I promise you that I'm not saying anything that's that groundbreaking. It's simply, even if we think about research questions, the research questions are biased. How do you know that, right? If someone isn't necessarily saying, wait a minute, let's, let's interrogate why one group is criminalized and the other group isn't, right? Why is a medical intervention made in the case of the white, white, uh, the wimpy white, uh, the wimpy white boy syndrome, and not the crack babies, right? So that's the. I think those are the things where, when presented in a way where it's not just all doctors and nurses and midwives and doulas are wrong, but it's saying in a way that we're functioning from the ways that we're socialized in society, all of us. So how do we A, become aware, and then what do we do? So the answer is the very thing you did for the, the newborn white male infants, you do for all, all of them. That's, I mean, it really is that simple. It's not a magic formula. You just do the very thing to save each baby's lives in the same ways that you privilege this group because of this inconclusive evidence based on this fiction of racial difference. Right, that, that young white male infants are born um, yeah, more sensitive and fragile um, to these negative uh, social determinants. That's, I think that's a really good commentary on our, our theme for this conference, that public health and the common good. What can we look around and see? Um, and, and the common good, <laughs> Let, yeah. let's think of it that way. Um, I wanna ask if there are any more questions from the audience, from um, Brooke or Judd, anyone else? I, I would love to ask a quick little follow-up on what you were just talking about. Um, it it, it reminds, what you're talking about is, you know, recognizing, recognizing the ways that racism is systemically ingrained in our medical structures today. Um, it reminds me of the, the idea of anti-racism, right? That it's not enough to just not be racist, but we have to be actively anti-racist. Um, what do you think, like, should we have medical students be required to take history lessons on the history of medicine? Or like, what are some ways that we can ingrain that anti-racism um, into our medical field today? Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, once again, it's, it's great for me to see the ways that medical organizations um, and institutions are really kind of turning the mirror onto themselves and say, okay, you know, the stats aren't good, what, what must we do? Um, so that's been really great. There's been an, an influx of medical humanities departments. I mean, I run one 
at uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln. So it's really great, I think, for, for students to learn the kind of nuts and bolts of the hard sciences and do the practical work, but also take on the critical thinking skills that historians have, I think that's so valuable. Um, so yeah, I do think those kinds of, you know, nowadays they're calling them the, the kind of learning modules uh, should be required, um, but it should be ongoing as well. And we're gonna have to literally tr change the infrastructure and that takes a little bit more time, um, you know, and it requires, Ooh, the practitioner, you know, for us to actually listen to some of the practitioners, especially the nurse midwives, the, the midwives, um, the doulas to allow um, more synergistic relationships to develop to the reproductive justice activists, um, the public health workers and scholars who've been kind of saying this since, geez, you know, for decades, um, because they have been the ones that typically get it right a little earlier than um, many of the, the medical practitioners. So that's what I think will happen if I can say this, and um, I think this ends on a really positive note. There are two things that, you know, in trying to get my students to, to become med, you know, medical humanities minors, right? Um, I tell them these two stories that happen within months of each other. So the first one was, I was looking at Lovecraft Country on HBO, right? I'm not into sci-fi. But I try to do these date nights with my husband, who's very into sci-fi. So I'm looking at it, and one of the episodes, I'm I'm looking at it, and I was like, "Babe, hey, I think this is based on my book." And he has a very James Earl Jones voice, and he's like, <laughs> "So arrogant." Um, I don't think so. Just because it has to do with medical experimentation, it's not your book. So I, so literally, the character says she's calling out the names, and she says, "Anarcha." Betsy, Lucy, I'm like, come on. Like, I didn't create this, but how would they have known? And then I start to get a bunch of like DMs and texts and people are contacting me via social media because they're like on HBO's Lovecraft Country podcast, the writers of the show shot you out. They're like, oh, and you know, medical historians and, and theorists and scholars like Deirdre Cooper Owens creates this concept of the medical super body, da, 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 da. So I was like, Oh my gosh, so this is the thing, even though people who watch HBO's Lovecraft Country will never know who Deirdre Cooper Owens is a medical bondage, but they now understand a little bit about medical history in this country and they can start to think critically about some of these disparities. So that's number one. Um, so popular culture helps, right? And we can't sometimes get caught up on, but why didn't they cite me? Because it's a show and that's not what they do. Right? It's not a medical journal, but at least people know. The other part that makes me really proud, um, uh, I got a, an email and I thought it was just somebody, I don't know, trying to troll me or something. So I didn't even respond. And then I read back uh, a couple of hours later and I was like, <gasps> so I get an email from someone from Congress and it's a really high ranking bipartisan committee. And they want to have a fact finding conversation with me with a, a COVID recovery bill. It hasn't come out yet, but there's a part on maternal care, like the maternal crisis, I should say. And they're trying to think of ways to repair it, but also attach money to it. And as I'm having this conversation around health disparities and the Black maternal health crisis, I'm realizing that the work that we do, right? Sometimes we think only our family members and friends, right? And 10 nice people will purchase our books, but it has such a lasting impact. And these were people in a bipartisan committee who were interested in finding out about the past so that it could explain the disparities of the 21st century. So the work we do is fundamentally important, um, important work. And so I just say, keep plugging away because you know I started this in 2005 as a grad student who knew all of these years later, right? Um, that folk would be interested in these stories about dead people, right? And, and what they've left us to, to grapple with, um, to change and to continue. Oh, Dr. Cooper Owens, um, I think we, we should probably let you have your day back, but this has been, this has been remarkable. I wanna read some of the comments um, from Helen Jones says, thank you into this look how doctors learned about women's health issues despite the experimentation done 
on enslaved women. This was a great keynote speaker. And Joanne Sorensen says, this was just so good. Thank you. I think that's the response to end on. This was just so good. Thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge with us and helping us understand better ways to navigate our world. So oh, my pleasure and my honor and continued success on the conference. And once again, I apologize for the technical glitch. Um, on Not a big one. But for yeah. those who want the PowerPoint, I can certainly provide that to um, Holly and Jedediah. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank right. you so much, Dr. Rollins. Thanks.